If that song and video didn't stir your heart today, we're going to have to hook you up to some kind of machine in this place. Lord have mercy. Thank you, Pastor Devin. Years ago, there was a movie that came out called Inside Out. I never saw the film, but I've been told about it. My kids have seen it. And the premise is there's a young girl, and she's going through a great change in her life. They're going to move cities because of her dad's job. And so they look at some of the emotions that she's feeling. You can imagine, you know, like an 11-year-old girl moving from one city to the next. And they have a headquarters set up in her mind. And these five personifications of emotions that she would be feeling. And they're going back and forth about how should she be thinking and feeling about what she's walking through. And so here's a picture of the five personifications that she has for... Oh, it's okay. This is not it, but that's really close to it, though. That, that's it. That's it right there. So five personifications that are in her brain. So number one, anger. Many of you can identify with that. Disgust, fear, sadness, and joy. So you can imagine new town, new school, new home, all the things that you would walk through just on a daily basis. And, and these are things that we all face so you can imagine if each of these was living in your brain, these are your emotions, and something great happens, you feel joy. Something hard happens, you feel sadness. When something you're unsure about, you feel fear. Something really makes you upset, disgust. Somebody makes you very upset, you feel anger. And so this morning, we're going to talk about the emotion and or the personification of worry. And so I wonder if we had a little character in our brains walking around in headquarters that looked like worry, Maybe would it look something like this? There's Mr. Worry walking around up there with his hands behind his back going, Oh, man, I wonder what's going to happen today. Or maybe something more like this is for you. What will be the next phone call that I get? Or maybe it's something like this. I just can't believe what I'm walking through. So today we're going to see what Jesus has to say about why we worry. If you have your Bible, turn to Matthew 6, we're going to get verses 25 through 34 today. J. Arthur Rank was an English executive, and so he could definitely see that worry was a part of many people's lives. And so he decided that he was not going to allow his days to be consumed with worry. So he designated one day a week to be his worry day, so he had worry Wednesdays. So anything that came into his life from Thursday through Tuesday that would cause him to worry, he would write it down, he would stick it in his worry box, and then on Wednesdays, he would pull those things out and he would read through them and give himself time to worry. And as he continued to do this week after week, he learned that almost everything that he had written down was no cause for worry at all. So that showed him that worry was really not adding anything to his life. Some statistics that I read one time were that 40% of all the things we worry about never happen, 30% are a part of our past that can't be changed. 12% are our worries or focused on criticism by others, and mostly they are untrue. 10% are about our health, which actually only gets worse with stress and with worry. And maybe 8% are about real problems that we face in this life. So today we're going to ask three questions to try to answer the question, why we worry. Number one. Who is in control? There was a husband and a wife, and they'd been married for some time, and they really loved each other, but here lately, they didn't like each other very much, okay? Married couples, can I get an amen? You know what that's like, I really love you, but right now, I don't like you so much. <laughs> they just couldn't figure out why they couldn't get on the same page, okay? We're in the book together, but we are not in the right chapter, we are definitely not on the same page. So the more they began to discuss and to talk about it, they determined that the husband was absolutely carefree in this life, but the wife was an absolute worry wart. She worried about everything. It didn't matter what it was. We're going to go out to eat for lunch today. Well, I hope there's not too many people there. I hope I order the right thing. What if I don't order the right thing? What if my food's not good? What if the food comes out and it's cold? What if I don't order the thing that I give me? What if it costs too much? What if we don't have enough money to pay for lunch? She worried about everything. Anybody here married to somebody that worries all the time? Anybody here know someone who worries all the time? 
Anybody here that person that worries all the time? So he just told her, listen, woman, by worrying all the time about everything, it brings you absolutely no benefit, no help whatsoever. Why do you keep worrying? And she goes, well, you say it doesn't help at all, but I know for a fact that it does help. And he goes, well, explain to me what worrying, how does that help you? She goes, because I have been keeping track of all the things that I worry about. And 90% of all the things that I spend time worrying about never happen. So see, she thought in her mind, well, because I'm worrying about these things, then they don't occur. When instead it was they never occurred, so why did she spend so much time worrying about them? And so we look at our lives and we say, you know, I really believe sometimes that when something bad has happened or I believe is going to happen, that if I'll spend some time with some inner turmoil about it and make myself really sick to my stomach, it's probably going to help the situation. And we convince ourselves of this. And here's what Jesus says about worry. Matthew 6, 25. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothing? Therefore means in light of. So we back up to last week's message. And he spoke about where is our treasure? Are we storing up treasures on earth, like clothes or possessions, things that raw moths or rust will destroy, things that thieves can break in and steal? Or are we storing up a treasure that is in heaven where moths and rust cannot destroy and thieves cannot break in and steal? And he says you can't serve two masters. You cannot serve the God of the eternal and the things of the temporary. And so you have to make a choice. So he says in light of this... Do not be anxious, do not be worried, do not be concerned, do not be distracted by those things that are temporary. Like what? Like what you eat or what you drink or what you wear. Now some of you are going, this is great news. Because when I saw the title of the sermon today, Why Worry? In my mind, I thought you were going to say that I shouldn't worry about anything. But here it sounds like Jesus is being very specific. Therefore, there's only three things that I'm not allowed to worry about, and that's what I eat or what I drink or what I wear. So to me, this means that Jesus is saying that what my doctor told me doesn't count anymore because Jesus trumps the doctor. So I don't have to worry about eating fried foods anymore. I don't have to worry about too many carbohydrates or too much sugar. So Jesus says, don't worry about what you eat. So that means no more Weight Watchers, no more calorie counting, no more keto, no more macros, none of that business. It is Krispy Kreme and Pizza Hut from now on because Jesus says, I don't have to worry about what I eat or what I drink. Too much coffee, five pots a day from now on because Jesus says, don't worry about that. And I don't have to worry about what I wear. This is great news. That means now I can wear a brown belt with black shoes. That'd be just fine. I can wear white after Labor Day. And overalls are always an appropriate attire. And so when we look at the context of what Jesus is saying, is he's giving them specific examples that they would understand. And he's not saying, hey, listen, there's only three things you don't need to worry about. What you eat, what you drink, and what you wear. He's saying, here's some examples of things that you should not be worrying about. But the overall point is this. You should not worry about anything. He says, because is life not more important than food and the body more important than clothing? Here's what that means. Who gave you your body? Well, that would be God. And who gave you physical life? Once again, that, that would be God. And who gave you your spiritual life? Oh, that would, that would be God too. And so, just by chance, do you think that the God who put more than 100 million cells in each of your eyes to enable you to see... 60,000 miles of arteries throughout your body, 9,000 taste buds in your tongue, over 200 bones wrapped in 600 muscles. Do you think the God who intricately put you together is unable to take care of what you're going to eat and drink and wear? Well, of course he can. I know that he can. Well, then why would you worry? Verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into the barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Jesus, the master teacher. They're sitting on the mountainside. He's in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. He is teaching to a crowd who is sitting all around him. And maybe at that moment he's speaking about what not to worry about. And birds fly across the sky. 
And he goes, just look at the birds. Do you see them flying? He goes, you see, they're not worried. He goes, just look at the birds of the air. They have everything that they need. Don't you think God cares more about you, his child, than he does the birds of the air? And he's not saying that birds just sit around the tree all day with their mouths open waiting for worms to fall in. He's not saying be like a bird and fly around all day and look for people to use the restroom on. But he's saying here's something you need to know about birds. They live day by day. And God takes care of all of their needs. So surely if God takes care of the birds, can't you trust him to take care of your needs as well? Verse 27, and which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? Just like the wife, we thought, well, the more I worry, the more problems that I eliminate. No, the more you worry, the more problems that you create. You don't add time to your life. In fact, you're taking time away from your life. Because regardless of what is to come, whether it is perceived or it is going to happen, whenever we worry about it, We are not helping. So he says, if we trust God, then we have absolutely nothing to worry about. But when we worry, we're saying that we don't trust God. Philippians 4. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Lift your request. Let them be known to God. And your peace of God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Romans eight thirty two. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who could be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? I can testify to the fact that I have done a lot of worrying in my life and it's never helped a single situation that I have ever been in. So Jesus says, if you want to live a righteous life, and a blessed life, stop worrying. Follow God's will, obey his plan, and trust him, and know that he is in control. Who's in control? God is. Number two, how will I be different? So we have fallen into this terrible pattern, and maybe you have too, that in the last years, for many, many, many moons, we have spent way too much money on Christmas presents. Way too much. And so every year I try to get my wife to say, you know, let's do something new this year. Like, I don't know, no Christmas presents at all. And that does never go very well. So we have a friend, one of our neighbors. And this is what they do down at their house. This may speak great truth to you today. Maybe the Lord needs you in this place to hear this. In their household, everybody gets four presents. One thing that you want, one thing that you need, one thing to wear, and one thing to read. Isn't that amazing? I love this idea. That way it's specific. You get something you want, something you need, something to wear, something to read. That covers all the bases in life. And you only got to get four things, just four presents. This is fantastic. Some of you are going, we are totally doing that in our house. Some of you are going, we are not doing that in our house. Mm, No, we are not doing that. So I've been trying to sell this idea to my wife. We need to do it for the four thing idea. This is great. Our kids are getting older. They don't need a bunch of stuff. They got everything they need. We need to do the four things. And she just wasn't quite sold on it. So I messaged our friend that does this in their house, and I go, hey, listen, I need you to do me a favor. Okay, well, no problem. I need you to text my wife and tell her that in your quiet time this morning, the Lord revealed to you that the Walters family needed to do the four things for Christmas. And she sent me back and goes, are you sure you want me to do that? Oh, yeah, I'm really sure. She's going to know that you put me up to this. I go, no, 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 she won't know. It'll be okay. Okay. So she does it. She says, I sent it. I sent the message. Didn't hear from my wife all day long. So I was thinking, that's kind of weird because I just knew for sure she would say, I knew Josh told you to tell me that, blah, 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 blah. So she comes in that evening. She goes, you are never going to believe what happened today. Do tell. I got a message from our friend. What on earth did it say? She said that during her quiet time this morning, the Lord told her that we needed to do the four things for Christmas. So I guess you were right all along. The Lord really wants us to do the four things. So we'll start writing these things down, and we're going to do the four things this year. And in my mind, I'm going, mmm, victorious. It worked. But in the back of my mind, I go, oh, man. Any minute, she's going to realize that I put our friend up to that and that I might die. 
And just about that moment, it gets real quiet. And she goes, did you talk to our friend this morning? And I'm going. <laughs> so I didn't say nothing at all, right? If you're not nice to say don't say nothing at all. So I'm just sitting there. She goes, you told her to send me that message, didn't you? So I can't lie, though, right? So I'm going, no, <laughs> yes. And so then I just can't help it. I just start laughing. I can't believe you sent her that message all day long. I thought the Lord had spoken to me and you done did, did that to me. And she wasn't really mad. She thought it was funny. And I was just joking. I wasn't trying to manipulate my wife through what the Lord had spoke. But even if that worked, that would have been okay. And so throughout this whole process, though, the goal was let's do something different. Let's not let this be the same year where we have all these presents and spend all this money on stuff that we don't really need. I want this year to be different. Maybe that's what your goal was for Thanksgiving, right? Let's let this year be different than always the same old thing. I want this week to be different. I just want this day to be different. I want this holiday season to be different. I want 2019 to be different than it has been. So Jesus shows us how we can really be salt, how we can really be light, how we can be different. Matthew 6, 28. And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So remember the image of the people at the time. They were overwhelmingly concerned about having clothes because they didn't have a lot. It was something they coveted. It was something they wanted. And they would store it up and store it up and store it up. And Jesus would say, you're spending all your time and all your money and all your energy on that big old wardrobe sitting in that closet over there that's going to be eat up by moths and rust and destroyed and one day stolen or given away. When instead you should be storing up a treasure that is in heaven that will never fade. You're giving all of your life, all of your time, all of your energy to something you're guaranteed to lose when you could be giving to something that you're guaranteed to keep. So let me show you how silly this is. And so Jesus, the master teacher, maybe he points over to the east and says, look at the lilies of the field. And maybe this is what they see. Beautiful. Just beautiful. He says, these are gorgeous today. And tomorrow they'll be cut down and thrown to the fire. They're just temporary, and yet they are even more beautiful than Solomon is clothed with all of his wealth and all of his glory. He says, these are just flowers. Do you not think that if I can clothe the lilies of the field, that I cannot clothe you as well? Oh, you of little faith. Preacher, I understand there are some things that we should not be worried about. We don't need to worry about food, or we don't need to worry about drink, or we don't need to worry about clothes, but what about the things that we need to worry about? What about doctor reports? What about car accidents, job interviews, school tests? What about family members? What about bear playoff games? What about affording Christmas presents? What about wives who were told that in their quiet time that somebody was supposed to do the four things and now they won't talk to you no more? What about things that really matter in this life? What about those things? Not clothes and food. What about serious issues? Verse 31. Therefore, do not be anxious saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? Do not be anxious about anything. Why not? Verse 32. For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. The Gentiles, the lost, the unsaved, those who do not know God, he says that's what they do. They worry about everything. They try to save up so they never run out. And he says, and you don't have to do that because God knows what you need before you know what you need. The expositors say the root of all anxiety is unbelief. And in Jesus' great plan, he doesn't just call, tell us to get rid of it. He says, don't just stop worrying, but replace it with what? Verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then all these things will be added to you. Don't just refrain from worry, but replace worry by seeking first the kingdom, by seeking salvation, obedience, worship, 
following him, loving him, serving him, sharing him with others, praying, reading your Bible, putting his will first, seeking after his righteousness, and then God will take care of everything else. He says, if you want to be different in this life, how can it, this year be different? How can I change to where I'm more like Jesus today than I was yesterday? And stop worrying and trust that God's going to meet your needs. Replace that worry with worship, because here's the truth. This morning when we were singing, was there anybody worried while we were singing? You can't worry while you worship, but you also can't worship while you worry. So some walked in this place today full of worry, and you couldn't put your heart on Jesus today because you were overwhelmed. You can't worship while you worry, but you can't also worry while you worship. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and God will take care of all the rest. And that sounds great. That sounds fantastic. Put away all the worry. I'm not going to be upset. I'm not going to be concerned. I'm not going to be overwhelmed. I'm not going to be burdened. And said, I'm going to refrain from worry. I'm going to replace it with worship and with trust and with seeking after God. It sounds fantastic, but then we still have this deep, dark desire within us that says, but if I don't worry, then that means I don't care. Because when I worry, that means I'm really putting forth the effort. And I'm showing this bothers me, and I'm showing that it concerns me, and I'm doing something about it. And we treat it as though we have a choice that says, okay, God gives me two doors. I have door A or door B. And door A is I can worry about the circumstances that are in or out of my control that may or may not happen. And door B is I can trust the Lord and not be anxious. And he never gives us a choice of A or B. He says for believers and for Christians, worry is a sin, so it's not an option. We must trust the Lord and put the worry away. So here's the third question. Will you live for yesterday, tomorrow, or today? Sometimes you overhear conversations as you walk around the church. Probably a year ago, I heard this conversation, and I just laughed and laughed. I thought it was so funny. There was a grandson who walked up to his grandfather in our fellowship hall. And he said, Grandpa, we're planning a family vacation for about three years from now. And we'd really like it if you would go with us. Do you think you could put that on your calendar? And Grandpa just sat there, and he thought for a minute. And he says, you're asking me if I want to go on vacation three years from now. He says, that's right. He said, son, at my age, I don't even buy green bananas. <laughs> You're talking about three years. I'm not sure I'm going to be here in three weeks. I just laughed and I laughed. And I thought, you know, what a different perspective, though, our life has that sometimes we're looking 30 years down the road or 10 years or two months or sometimes we just look for tomorrow. Here's what verse 34 says. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Therefore, in light of all of this, do not be anxious. And some will say, well, you know, I'm not really a warrior. I'm not really anxious. I'm just concerned or I'm just burdened. You call it what you want to call it. Don't be anxious because tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient is today for its own trouble. Here's what that means. Tomorrow's going to give you plenty of things to walk through. You don't have to worry about that today. Tomorrow will handle itself. Today is going to give you plenty of things to walk through all by itself. Fearing tomorrow's possible or probable misfortunes will not benefit you in any way. So here's all that you need to know. Today, God is going to give you all the grace that you need to make it through today. And tomorrow, he's going to do that same thing. And the next day, he'll do it again. And the next day, he'll do it again. So you don't have to worry about tomorrow. Just today. I used to tell people that my two greatest spiritual gifts were sweating and worrying. Because I'm really good at both of those things. I've been worried, I think, since conception. I probably worried in the womb, thinking, hey, it's getting a little small in here. I'm growing. 
I'm not seeing anything else growing. What's going to happen when we run out of space? Am I going to run out of air? Am I going to run out of food? What are they going to do with me? Can you imagine how I felt when they pulled me from my mom? It's freezing out here. Nobody's putting any clothes on me. Why is everybody wearing masks? Do they have a disease? Do I have a disease? Am I going to get sick? Why are you taking me from my mama? Are you going to bring me back? Does she not love me already? What's going on? This pattern continued throughout my whole life. I worry as much as anybody that I've ever met. And so I want to share this great truth with you today. I have almost 40 years of worrying experience. And never one time has it ever helped. Not one time has it ever changed the circumstance. And not one time has it ever drawn me closer to Jesus. Never. Because worrying is sin. And when we worry, we tell God that we don't trust him. And I trust him. So I don't want to worry anymore. I read a story about a pastor. He was on a long flight. And as things got going throughout the evening, whoo, the weather was getting rough. The plane was shaking. It was going up and down. The captain came over the intercom and said, I'm sorry, we're not going to be able to serve drinks right now because the weather's just too bad. And so it was popping up and down, lightnings and storms and waves, and it was very dangerous. And he looked all around the plane, and people were getting pretty upset, and they were getting worried, and some people were crying. About that time, he says, hey, listen, we're not going to be able to serve the meal either. This weather is just too rough. And so the lightning was flashing, the wind was blowing, the airplane was popping up and down, and all the pockets of air and the turbulence. People were crying, people were praying, people were scared to death. And the preacher says, oh, I'm not afraid to admit it. I was pretty worried. This might be my last flight ever. And he looked over, and he saw this little girl sitting by herself, and she was just reading a book. Just calm as can be, not worried, not crying. For two hours they went through this storm and finally it passed and everything got calm. And he walked over there and he sat by that little girl and he says, I just have to ask. People were crying, people were screaming, people were praying. They were scared and you just sat there completely unfazed by the storm. Could you tell me why it didn't bother you or why you weren't upset? And she said, well, that's easy, mister. She said, my dad's the pilot. And he's taken me home. And the end of the story said, we walk through a lot of storms in this life. Sometimes physical, spiritual, emotional. But no matter what storms we walk through, we just have to remember that God is in control and our Father is the pilot. And he's taken us home. Do you worry about too much in your life? Here's some questions that we need to ask ourselves. Who's in control? God is in control, and if God stands before me, who could ever stand against me? We can trust him. How will I be different? I'm going to refuse to worry, even if everybody else does, because God has cared for me every day of my life, and he has not failed me once, and I don't think he's going to start tomorrow. And whatever I walk through in this life, I know that it has first passed through the hand of God. So he's going to see me through. Yesterday, tomorrow, or today, which will I focus on? I'm going to focus on today because this is the day that the Lord has made. So I will worry. I will be overwhelmed. I'll be concerned. I'll be burdened. I'll be anxious. No, this is the day the Lord has made. So I will rejoice and be glad in it.